sin is toward death or um, a sin is toward death uh, it is a sin toward death there is a sin toward death in the context um, so sometimes a me can be used as there it is well yeah because it, it just you know it just it's like it, is. it exists it exists there it is you know in other words, the subject is within a me. Um, a sin toward death is. There is a sin toward death. Uh, let's see, who do you want to do 17? Who has it from Christ? Robert. Robert? Robert. 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 <laughs> okay. You gotta tell a note for Etika. Mm -hmm. What is wrongdoing, unrighteousness, wickedness, unjustice? All wrongdoing is sin. And sin is not. Sin is not to death. Well, again, and, and there, is a, there sin, is a sin not to death. There is sin not to death. So there is sin toward death and sin not toward death. Anybody have any questions on what that means? Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> My wife does too. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> um, if you see someone sinning a sin not unto death, then ask and he, God, will give to him life to the one sinning not unto death. There is sin to death. I'm not saying ask concerning these. All right? Um, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not to death. Well, you always want to you always want to try to interpret a text by not importing any more than you have to. But this is a troublesome text by itself, right? Um, so, at, at the end of the day, we, we also want to interpret a text in light of the whole Bible. Because we assume that the Bible makes sense as a whole, right? So, I mean, I'm in a tension here in, in my exegesis. I don't want to, I don't want to import into the text. I let the text speak for itself. But I also, and I'm always in this tension. But I'm also wanting to interpret in a way that's consistent with the rest of Scripture. One of my presuppositions that I bring to the text as I interpret is that the Bible isn't contradictory, right? <clears throat> But, I, but I'm so confident of that pre presupposition that I can interpret a text, you know, as it stands uh, on its own merits. Is that cat carrying a kitten or something? Like that? Uh, I'm behind the bush now. Anyway, um, it looked like it was carrying a kitten of the same color. Probably, and I probably had him in my garage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> crazy cat. So, you know, there isn't so much within this text to, to purely answer the question for me. So what could you be talking about? Well, I know that, um, yeah, 1 Corinthians 11, um, and even Hebrews 12, 1 Corinthians 11 particularly talks about Christians who are disciplined to death. Um, so I don't take it as being a particular sin <laughs> that leads to death. I take it as sin that for whatever reason in God's sovereignty, he has chosen to discipline to death. Whether it's persistent or heinous or whatever. Now, I, think, I think it becomes God's sovereign choice as well. Right? So simply John is saying that if you see someone in sin and they're still alive, pray for them. But if you see someone who has sinned and now they're dead, don't bother praying for them. It's, it's about not praying for the dead. Now, you may appreciate that if you think of parents, for example, who may have a teenage child who is drinking and driving and out of control in their life and they're very worried about him and he ends up in an accident and die. 
Can you imagine a parent being prone to pray that God would somehow forgive that child of theirs for their sin? But the fact is that it's too late. If a person has died, to pray that God is going to do anything at that point. But what's done is done at that point. But if they're still alive, then there's still room for repentance, right? In other words, once you die, there's not going to be a repentance or not going to be you know, dealing with sin beyond what there was in the world. See what I mean? I don't think the sin unto death is a particular sin, but the sin unto death is virtually any sin, really, that God has chosen to discipline with death in a person's world. So if you see a person sinning and they're not dead, they're still hope. And a lot of hope is part of this verse. Yeah. Pastoral question. Yes. In your experience, have you ever buried anyone that you were pretty well convinced that sin to sin up there? Or doesn't that happen? I think it happens. And that's how I'll tell you the story. But yeah, I think it can happen. But, you know, how do we know? I mean, it's pretty tough for us to know, you know, somebody's... I don't think we can sit and judge, okay, that person sinned a sin under death. But, you know, it kind of, to me, this kind of bashes the idea of purgatory. This kind of bashes the idea of being baptized for the dead. Can't even pray for the dead. You know, this, this bashes the, the idea of, you know, lighting a candle for dead relatives or whatever, right? Um, I think I think the principle behind this, this is that if you're still alive, there's still hope. If you're dead, you died in whatever condition you died in. So there's not going to be any restoration of fellowship if you're a Christian uh, any more or less after you're dead than there would be anyway because you're dead. I mean, things will be restored, but in their own way. Yes? Um, when he says that, in my translating on when it says, you know, whoever sees his brother sinning or sin not toward death, uh, he will ask and will give to him life. It sounds like he's going to give him life. Is that like he may or may not give him life? Well, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty solid, you know, he will ask and he will give to him life. But remember what it said in the previous paragraph. Whatever we ask according to his will, he hears oh, us. That makes sense. So there's a, a little bit of a contingency there. You know, I, I'm struggling a little bit with your interpretation of that. Yeah, me too. Can you think of a better one? Well, I'm not saying I understand it, but it just seems more to me than just not praying for the dead. I mean, like, duh. I mean, okay, they're well, dead. Yeah, that's a duh to us, but this is to everyone. I know, but he says, if you see a brother sinning. Well, he, yeah, I mean, it is more than that, because he, he, he is encouraging prayer for sinning brothers. You're right to say that there's more, because that's the point of it. I think what he's, I think it's almost an afterthought. I mean, he's encouraging prayer for sinning brothers, but he's saying, oh, but, but be aware. I mean, if this brother sins to the point of death, I'm not saying pray for him, but, but pray for the one who's sinning. But go ahead. Well, that's just it. You see him. Now, well, you see, how do you see someone sinning a sin in the dead? We don't know what that sin is. We don't know if, if that will be the if that will be the final result of, of, no. of what's, what's Until they die. Happen. But if you will see Until a brother, they die. If you yeah. see a brother in process, clearly in sin, and then dies, now, you know, was he judged specifically because of his sin? But he well, I guess he sinned sin unto death, didn't he? He sinned it till he died. But I don't know, I mean, people don't know. Until he died. That covered the idea of the consequences, the natural consequences for our sin. If we're involved in behavior that deteriorates our habits or whatever, when we die. Yeah. I mean, this could cover that, I guess. It could cover, well, drunk driving is a very natural consequence. Well, I think that maybe in the context then, it's. If I see someone sin, a brother, and I, I don't know if it's a sin unto death or not, but I, I know that I will have 
confidence that he will hear me. And um, if that brother dies, then I understand that that was a sin to death. Um, Maybe it's because of maybe it's because for me it's a no-brainer. I don't pray for dead people, but like you said, for others it's they think it's another chance to. Well, there have been there have been Christians doing things, including praying for dead people. Catholic. What about first century? Was that a practice of Jews that they would? I don't know if it's a practice with Jews, but it probably you could probably find a practice in some of the religions. Of it seems like a weird way to say that. It seems like a weird way to say that. Don't pray for But I don't, I don't have any better. Uh, it, it sounds as good as any Well, that's why I'm trying to be so tentative about my, I mean, it's a tough passage and it's unclear, but I think what he's saying is, I mean, I think, I think, I think he starts by saying something that is fairly straightforward, but then he sees it could be taken in the wrong way, right? Because sometimes people's sin leads to death. So are we praying for dead people now? And he kind of, I think he kind of sees, oh, well, if you misinterpret that, you could go into error. And, and so then he tries to, not really backpedal, but he tries to you know, backfill so that people are not going to have an error. So he's just saying, if anyone sees a brother sinning a sin not to death, I mean, you know, maybe maybe the idea of sinning a sin not to death and to death is more you know, in the beginning of this thought. But um, you know, people are asking to give the men life the one sinning not to death. I mean, to me, how do you know if we're sinning a sin unto death or not? You know? <laughs> Either they're alive or not. Unless you're a prophet, you have to wait until they actually die. And yeah. You know. yeah, that's that's why, that's that, that's the main reason why I can't really see why, how it could be taken another way. Because you can't know. <laughs> you know? Because, yeah, I can't. And, and he acts like you should be able to tell. Right. You know, which would make me think that they were must have already died. And it, he acts like he also acts like that um, this is not something they previously discussed. Because he says, oh, you know, there is a sin under death and there is sin not under death. So it's not like an inside, you know, discussion or something that we're getting. You know, so, has, yeah. has anybody used this to support uh, there's there's different degrees of sin? You know, some sins are worse than others. I don't know. Okay. I don't think that. Or that sin will. Some sins will. Actually, yeah. I mean, I, I just don't see life working out that way that those who sin a worse sin uh, uh, get consistently judged temporally more harshly by God. Um, I think it's more of a sovereign choice. God doesn't discipline us all the same. In other words. Although, you know, 1 Corinthians 11 thing that we're referring to has to do with communion. You judge the body uh, wrongly. And there's a great play on words there, by the way. Um, the body of Christ that we're celebrating in communion. But he who judges the body wrongly, that's the body of Christ. So get the picture of communion. The body of Christ is coming together to remember the body of Christ crucified. It's kind of an interesting thing going on there with communion. And so if you disrespect the body of Christ, the church, in the context of remembering the body of Christ crucified, that's a very serious thing. In other words, if you bring division, if you bring division into the body of Christ, the church, at the communion table, which is the one place where we all ought to be united, right, that becomes very, very serious. Because to me, as I've said to my church, the ground is level at the cross and the ground is level at the communion table. Who has the authority to do communion? I don't believe it's a priest or a pastor that has authority to do communion. I don't believe it's an individual Christian that has authority to do communion. I think the authority of the communion to do communion resides in the church, the body that Paul is talking about, the body of Christ. The church has the authority to do communion. So if the pastor's not there on that Sunday, can they still do communion? Absolutely. 
Uh, and what Paul is fighting against in 1 Corinthians 11 is making a time not to be utterly uniting. You know, we might not agree on interpretations of 1 John. <coughs> right? But we can agree on the meaning of the cross. Right? So as Christians, we all, in, in a church, we all have to be able to come together and that will be a, a marvelous uniting time. We might, we might disagree on theological things, we might disagree on the color of the carpet, many things we might disagree on, but we ought to all be able to come together and unify um, around the communion table. <coughs> and I think that that being so close to you know, gospel and salvation issues, the, the communion table, I don't think that there are proper distinctions in the communion service between men and women, pastors and lay people, any of that kind of stuff. I don't see, I don't see any reason why anyone, anyone that the church is comfortable with from the standpoint of you know, they are fine representatives of the church, uh, I don't see why anyone couldn't leave communion in the church. You know, I mean, if they're out living in sin or something like that, that would know, disqualify them. You know, but anybody that the church can have confidence in their Christian life and testimony, I don't see why they can't be. I don't see why women can't be involved in, in community service or you know, passing out communion right now. You know, if a woman takes a chance of at a community service of preaching or teaching, I might have more trouble with that at that point. But, you know, I don't see a problem with a woman, you know, leading a community service or passing out the elements or whatever. I, I just see the ground breaking level. At the cross, and you know, at the cross, there's any difference between women and pastors or whatever. And I don't think there, I think there really should be at, at the communion service either. Um, and it is, it is bringing division into that that Paul says is so serious. And because people do that in Corinth, they are sick or dead. So I want to make sure I remove anything divisive. And I'm kind of extreme with this. I, I don't want to enter in. I don't want to introduce into the communion experience anything divisive. And I want to affirm that it is the church that does this. I think that when you, I think you can do communion in a way that disrespects the church mightily. Can you go worship on your own? Yeah. Can you go read your Bible on your own? Yeah. Can you go do evangelism? on your own, yeah. Can you have a Greek class on your own, outside the offices of a church, yeah. What shouldn't you do? There are a couple things you shouldn't do on your own, and they are the ordinances. You have no right to go off doing communion on your own, that's a church. And you have no right to go off doing baptizing on your own, that's a church. If you go to the park and lead somebody to the Lord and there's a pond there and they say baptize you, your answer should be no, I don't have any right to baptize you. The church baptizes you. And you can bring up Phil, but, but was there a, a, a church uh, ready to baptize him in those early days and wasn't he on his way to a foreign country where there was no church and he would be the only Christian and stuff like that? It's a different thing with Philip, right? We're not little Philip coming around ready to baptize people, right? That belongs to the church. And by the church you mean? The local church. So, okay. Have you ever had someone ask you, let's say they're in the hospital, to do communion with them? I have, yeah, at home and stuff like that. And I try really hard to avoid that. See, to me, <clears throat> uh, I, I am not happy at all with people going home within their family and doing communion. So they don't have any business to do it again. You're really disrespecting the body of Christ at that point. That ordinance belongs to the church. And I don't have any authority, I don't have, as a pastor, any authority within me to do communion. I don't think the Catholic or other views of that are right. You know, the priest is why you can do communion. I don't think so. But I don't think just the average Christian has it either. It's, it's meant to unify the church. I'm not happy with the youth group going off on a camping trip or to camp and doing communion because the whole church is not invited to that. To me, my whole church needs to be invited for us to have communion. Now, is my whole church always going to be there? No, but no one's excluded, right? So, you know, I'm not going to be having communion at board meetings. I'm not going to be having, 
you know, I'm not going to be allowing the youth group to go off and do communion. Um, I taught in the Bible college where around Easter, a pastor came in and led the students in communion. I didn't go. It's not, it doesn't belong to Bible college. It belongs to the church. I was at a pastor's conference where they all had took communion. I didn't. He was the only one of a thousand people in the room who didn't take communion. But that does not belong to whatever denominational outfit is doing that. Uh, it belongs to the church. It is a, it, and it is a powerful unifying thing, isn't it, within the church? And we, we rip that out of its context and it becomes a cheap thing. You know, we can, we can get youth all, you know, emotional and everything by doing communion someplace, but it's not appropriate to me. And so I'm very strict about that. I take a very strict interpretation because of the consequences. <laughs> because if you disrespect the body, then you could come up sick or you could die. If you took a, pe a group of people to the Holy Land, <clears throat> would you do um, um, communion in the... No, no because uh, almost certainly my whole church is not going to be able to do that. I think the only time we ever did it was when we had like, our church service there. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of people do that. You know, like, whatever. So you wouldn't baptize people in the Jordan River either. Um, I wouldn't look at that as being, you know, baptism. I would, you know, if you if you want to get baptized in the Jordan River just for the sake of it, you know, that is a whole other thing. But that's not my baptism. That's not you know, my baptism happened in the church. I mean, to me, that's a different thing. That's kind of like I'm walking up with Prince of Jesus. I'm, but you know, I might have trouble with that too. But Paul doesn't talk about baptism in the same sense, although he may infer it because it's an order. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that you know being baptized out there is a device if you're disrespecting the body. It, well, you know, if I, I don't know if I, uh, you know, if that's if that's a person's ever been baptized, oh, I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized in Jordan. Uh, are we representing the church? <clears throat> I don't know. I'd have to think through that. Right. It's actually more public than uh, yeah. Most of our church, I think, are it is baptisms. It is. Yeah. Yeah. You you mentioned the importance of it being the local church. As opposed to the city university church, but um, in saying in saying that, then is it equally wrong for a believer visiting outside of his local body in, in another church then, to partake in communion with another body that's not his? Well, I can I can understand the idea of closed communion. You know, that you should be a member of this church to take communion. I don't really practice that because I think there's also a level which you respect the universal church. You know, this person is part of the universal church, the local church is within the universal church, and you're a Christian. Now, you know, to say, well, the universal church is going to hold communion, I don't buy that. But, you know, a Christian that it happens to be, you know, in a local church, I don't have a problem with that Christian participating with those people. I, I don't think that's divisive within that body. I think that's more of an inclusive thing. But I've been asked to do communion, uh, you know, in people's homes and stuff like that, and... Uh, if I can avoid it at all, I do. I, I don't know. I just, I'm just not comfortable with it. You know, I, it's, it's not something in the text that you can see is cut and dry. I and mean, I'm, I'm inferring quite a little bit of distance. My inference becomes a little bit distant from the text at this point. I understand that. Um, so how would you ever baptize the first person in an area? To <clears throat> well, that's back to the Philip thing. Yeah. You know, if there is no church to disrespect, you know, um, you, you need to do that. Uh, it's a, it, you know, in that sense, a missionary thing becomes. That's a little different. Different. disrespecting the church to baptize someone outside. Pardon? I, don't, I guess I don't see why it's disrespecting the church to baptize someone outside of the. Well, the thing we miss about baptism is that bat we, we say that baptism is a way of identifying with Christ, saying I'm a Christian and I, and I identify with Christ. The thing we miss about baptism is the other direction. Baptism also says I identify with these people. Who is baptizing you? Mm -hmm. I'm now becoming one of these people. Right. You know, if an alien were in a spaceship looking down at someone being baptized, and they understood that as an initiation rite of some sort, they would they would say that person is becoming one of those people. So, but did, but does that mean they would have to be in the building with everybody? Oh no, the building is nothing. Well, it is the assembly. Could it be like certain people from the church that? You know that are on a group. 
trip or something. Well, that's why I don't see in Scripture the whole issue of divisiveness related to baptism. You know, if you want to say we represent the church, and so you're identifying with us as part of the church. Um, see, I, I don't think baptizing is a unifying activity for the church. Baptizing is an accepting this person into the church activity for the church. But I see communion as a unifying activity of the church. Could, could we not take communion with, with other believers outside of our local body if we were in that situation in, in order to express our union with them? Um, and, and, well, you, you know, could, but I wouldn't. Agree. Because what union do you have with them? You're, it, you have union in Christ with them. You do, and communion has nothing to do with that. I I don't think so. I I think that I think an individual Christian can have a fine spiritual life and never take communion. The the communion service is not about my relationship with God so much as it is about our relationship with God. Right, but don't you have that that our relationship with other believers that don't belong to your local body? Not in the same sense because another thing we don't understand about the church is when we are members of the church, we, we enter into a very serious relationship with people. It's a relationship of responsibility and accountability under the leadership of the church. And as Americans, we blow that off because we're so individualistic. But no, I'm not accountable to the average Christian on the street or accountable for the average Christian on the street like I am um, the people in my church. There is a difference there. See? And, and so I think if I went out taking communion with just a bunch of Christians out there, uh, I am um, disrespecting my church and diminishing my involvement and responsibility in my local church. Even if you're like on a mission trip, like long term? What, what? Like when, that, when that, Paul was down for a couple of years or whatever? That's a whole other thing. Yeah. It's a completely different thing. If you're sent out from a church to do what? Paul was a church planter. Right. So obviously if Paul was out there you know, planting churches, you know, he is now, you know, if you're with, you know, with another group and you're participating in community, you know, I don't have a problem with entering into a local church's thing that they're doing. Right. But, you know, I, I can't make a perfectly, I can't make a perfectly, you know, watertight, airtight sort of argument for practice around this, but what do you do, I mean, it, j- I'm saying is try to understand the significance of communion and, and what do you do with it in light of Paul's complaint about the disunity in the church and the consequences for that. And is it just about not waiting and taking your communion before other people get there? What's the what's the problem? It's, the problem is that it's disunifying, and if that's a problem, it's because communion should be a unifier, not a disunifier. Right? So what what is our mentality about our church? Do we really have a sense that that we are accountable to the leadership of our church. You know, when uh, when I was planning to go to England to get my PhD, uh, there were some rumblings on the board of my church that um, you know maybe that wasn't being in ministry. Maybe that maybe that wasn't what the church should support. So I asked them to have a special meeting of the board to talk about that because I said, if you, the board of this church, think that that is not being in ministry and I know I'm called to ministry, then I better not do that. And I don't think I would have, but they, they back way off of it. They went, oh, we didn't think about that. Um, you know, yeah, we think this is further in your ministry, so then I did it. But do we have the concept of us you know, in our church being accountable? And as pastors being accountable to a group of men who at least function as elders, and elders being accountable to the pastor, and those kinds of things. We blow those things off in the church. And therefore, our churches are very weak. Um, so to me, communion in the church is something analogous to sex in a marriage. I know many people who want to really downplay the significance of our, let's say, membership in a local body because they want to see the importance of the, the body of Christ universal. Yep. And you know, I, I'm with you <laughs> about the, the importance of our connection with the local church and what that really means. But how how do you 
how do we initiate, I guess is the best word, someone into that relationship? Because I think there are a lot of people who attend churches that aren't really, uh, they, they haven't really bought in. And, and they are have a superficial relationship for whatever reason, whether they like the experience sure. of worship or whatever. Sure. And I have good friends that, that say, you know, I don't think the idea of membership is even biblical. So I Which just, is a ridiculous I, statement. I present that to you, and I, I just, I mean, how would you... Uh, but to have, it, yeah, that's a great membership. Depends on how you define membership. If you define membership as like membership in the club, like the Elks Club, where you pay dues and you're a member, no, that's not biblical. But what does Ephesians 4 say about, or, or even more, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 say about being members of a body, right? So we're not members of our church like people are members of the Elks Club. We are members of our, of our church like my hand is a member of my body. But it is a deliberate decision on the part of the Christian, and it's a deliberate decision on the part of when the saints go marching in. Uh, it, it is a deliberate decision on the part of the Christian. It's a deliberate decision on the part of um, the church to, to, to be in a relationship of responsibility and accountability where we uh, are responsible for one another, we are accountable for one another, and you know, you say, well, I mean, if you made that decision, shouldn't we know about it? And I mean, don't we have to know about it? Shouldn't it be a mutual decision? And shouldn't we at least write it down? <laughs> you know, what's a piece of paper? Well, if I handed you a hundred bucks, that's just a piece of paper that you wouldn't disregard it. Or you know, a lot of people say about a marriage license, it's just a piece of paper. But I think Christians understand that it's not just a piece of paper. So a a commitment that is somehow documented to a group of believers, to me, is uh, are you a hand or foot or eye or nose in this body, or aren't you? We need to know. You need to know. I think. Um, because we have a relationship. What other ways do you foster or nurture, nurture the body, that idea of uh, buy-in and all that? Well, you, you, I think you talk about it in these ways. I think, you can, I think you can nurture it when it comes to baptism. I think you can nurture it when it comes to communion. Uh, you know, because in our baptism, I don't just talk about people uh, having a testimony that they're connected with Christ and they're Christian, but it's also a testimony that they're connected with the church. Um, I don't know how we got off on all of this, but so I, I'm really careful about the whole communion thing and just going off and, and people doing communion. I, I said this at my church. This blew me away because one, one of the deacons said, well, I was, we were going to have a family gathering and my uncle was going to do communion at the fa uh, family gathering. So we talked about it a little bit. And afterwards we talked about it. He said, well, I'm going to have to talk to my uncle about this and see if we can do something else other than communion as a spiritual sort of thing for our family. And it blew me away. that, And I'm telling him, I said, hey, I told him about being in that whole group of pastors. And I said, all those pastors took communion. So I'm in the minority here. I'd like to tell people that. If I'm in the minority, I tell them. This is not, this is my view, but it's not, the majority of you, and I, I won't look down on you if you take a different view and go have communion. You know, that's up to you. Because I am in the minority on that. And, but he had enough respect for me to say, well, no, we're not going to do that. Then. I'm going to tell my neighbor to do something else. Which betrayed a different view of the church, didn't it? They had a respect for the church and the leadership of the church, which really in some sense kind of blew me away because you don't respect the Bible. But, you know, there are a few reasons, a few big reasons why our churches are so weak, and they are very weak. And that's one of them. We don't, we don't, I mean, what is special about the church? Is there nothing special about the church in Scripture? <laughs> you know? I think it's interesting. I was just looking at the First Corinthians 12 passage, and just a, I guess, a, a good, uh, um, I guess, support for the idea that it's, he's talking about the, the local body rather than the church universal is that in uh, verse 27 he says now you are Christ's bodies and I think that if he was talking about church, church or our Christ's body when, if he was talking about uh, church universal he would probably include himself mm, good point. in that that's the point and members in particular well what is, it, what is, what is in our tradition at least in my tradition of my tradition is similar to yours, Pastor Joe. 
Um, communion time is what, oh, we confess our sins to God. Somehow, somehow we got into, because we don't understand 1 Corinthians 11. You know, you judges the body, right? Well, that's talking about relationships within the body, right? And so we get real quiet and we are very introspective when we do communion. And I don't think there's anything, necessarily anything wrong with that, but it's kind of missing the point of communion. So often I say, look up and look around at the people taking communion with you. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ, and we unify together in this thing. You know? And to me, um, you know, that, that whole idea of the body of Christ, remembering the body of Christ on the cross, is very powerful. Well, well there's where I think that people who come in with attitudes, they're, they've been resentful, they're bitter, they're angry, they're critical, with, they have issues with other people in the body. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is a dangerous yeah. place to be. Yeah, I think. I'm communing something. Um, sometimes I wonder, you know, that maybe God just do this more, like he did in 1 Corinthians 11. But then I think if he did, there wouldn't be too many people left, and I might not be here either. So Let's, let's turn that off. And... Uh, Okay. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Are we on verse 18? Yes. Okay, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin. Now, remember tenses here, all right? Another one of my presuppositions when I approach scripture, is that the writer of scripture is a competent writer. <laughs> right? And he's not making a mistake. And that the readers are fairly competent readers as well. The original reader. Right? So I think we need to give John the benefit of the doubt that he is saying something here that is meant to be, to, to grab attention, really to grab people by the throat, right? To shake them up. We know that everyone who has been born from God does not sin, right? So he's shaking people up, he is, but he's also saying something that is true, right? And he's making you stop and think, right? Again, the answer to this, I think, is in the present tense, doesn't sin, right? I mean, Let's give John the benefit of the doubt and pretend that he's saying something understandable here, okay? All right? Um, but um, the one born from God, now that's a reference to Christ, the one who born, so that's an Harris passive participle, isn't it? The one born from God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the world, the whole world, lies in the evil one. We know, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given to us understanding in order that we might know the truth. Well, I think that's the one that is the true, dependable. And that's why I got confused with the other one. Right? Mm -hmm. we, know, we might know the true one, is what that really means. Okay? We might know the true one. And we are in the true one, in his son, Jesus Christ. Um, this is the true God in life eternal. But this one is the true God. It seems to me to be a statement of the divinity of Christ, doesn't it? Uh, and life eternal. So, John has obviously said that if we say that we are not, that we do not sin, we make him right. But he just said in verse 16, if anyone sees a brother sinning a sin, right? A brother, a Christian, saved person, we take that as, right? So if you see a Christian sinning a sin, pray for him and God will give him life. All right, so the fact that Christians sin is very much established by the book of First John, right? But then he says, we know that everyone who has been born of God um, does not sin. Now, can we agree that having been born of God is something similar to being born again, right? Um, that you're saved if you're born from God, right? How do you put that all together? Well, 
What does it mean, doesn't sin? Uh, to me, it means continually, I, I, I think the answer is pressing the derivative nature of the present to the, present, the present to the extreme. Right? Doesn't sin continually, always, in an unbroken pattern? Is there sin in the life of the believer? Absolutely. But if there's nothing but sin in a person's life, how would you know that? I can't know that about anybody, right? But I could look at my own life and say, do I think there's nothing but sin in my life? <laughs> right? If I don't see anything but sin in my life, I might question, have I been born from God? There's no indication that I have been born from God. Like that. But again, remember, 1 John tells us that we're not the ones that ultimately decide that, are we? God does. Right? So my assurance is not what decide, determines my salvation. It is God's understanding of whether I have saving faith in So it is the end of first John. Except for verse 21. Um, <laughs> we're going to end this if it kills. Uh, children, guard yourselves from the idols. But see that kind of out of nowhere, doesn't it? Um, but in a way, that's what he's saying all along. Right? There are there are things that can take the place of God. The true one. Mm -hmm. The true God. I'm talking about the true God. And even for the Christian, even though we are not ultimately aligned with false gods or a false god, we can still have idols that take us away from the true God. All right, cool. That's your homework, Ken. Do you need to take a break?